Uh, we already did the introductions, but this was something that I left out of it. My name was not uh, McFadlin to begin with. I was born Michael John Davis Allen. My parents were hippies, hyphenated my last name. So it was Davis and Allen. My wife, McFeely. Okay? She's born to a family of uh, all girls, so their name is going to disappear uh, as soon as, well, they all die, which is kind of depressing. But that's the way things go. Um, so their name's going to disappear, and so we would kind of gone back and forth about what we could do about our names. And our hippie parents was like, oh, we could add another hyphen. Two hyphens seemed a bit excessive. Uh, so one night while playing around with a napkin, uh, I had a little bit of fun. Anybody recognize a little bit of fun? Nobody? You just mixed your names together. So I went through and said, what if we kind of uh, erase that? And erase that. And that. And that. We smash it all together, we get McFavlin. I went home, told my wife, and I was like, ah, this is what I came up with. She's like, that's awesome, that's what we're doing. And I was like, yeah. okay. And that is the birth of our name. Right? That's where it came from. Um, turns out, if you're getting married and you're a woman, getting your spouse's name is really easy. If you're getting married and you're a man changing your name, it's not so easy. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that involved lots of like sitting down in front of a judge being like, why are you changing your name? Oh, I'm getting married. No, really, I asked, why, why are you changing your name? Really, I'm getting married. That's my wife. I'm like, oh, okay, sir, whatever. Like, Come on. It's not that big of a deal. Um, but that's where it came from. Okay? So I like that story just because I think it's kind of a fun story, and it also sets us up for what we're trying to do within science. And I said, well... You just made up some random stuff. Guess what science is? Making up some random stuff. It just so happens that the observations we're making in science are repeatable. Okay? So if we took this pattern making and looked at other couples, would we see that pattern making continue to propagate in those other situations? Okay? And in this case, no, we don't. So me creating a name doesn't become science. Okay? But a large part of what we do within any science field is making an observation, coming up with an explanation, and then testing that theory. Okay? Does it apply to other situations? Okay? And that's what we're trying to do within chemistry. Okay? Um, as another little bit on kind of re review, we have the reading, writing, uh, solve journal, the RWSs. Okay? So an RWS, okay, the solve part of this, I know we're all roughly first time to chemistry, but someone might be able to answer this. So one of the things that you're expected to do is answer potentially multiple choice questions from a practice exam. Okay? So if that was your question, what do you submit as your solve for it? It's kind of a hard question. Anybody have a stab at it? Want to take a stab at that? Yeah. Thank you, by the way. Now I go in to grade your work. And what I see as your submission for the solve is C. C what? Okay. I don't have any context. You could even give me the question. Okay, okay so you said C. Okay. How did you get to that answer? Okay. With all the work there, so there's plenty of people that don't know the answer, right? Is that a yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see C. How did he get that answer? Guess. As a grader, that's what I see. You just guessed. Okay. That's not working for the solves. You need to process through, show me your thought process. Okay. So we'll put you back on the spot. Why did you say C? Okay, so let's pause. You keyed on this word, non-metal. Yeah. 
Okay? And you went through and said that mercury is a nonmetal, right? Right. Okay. Well, are other of those nonmetals? Hmm. Yeah. So as your work, what you could go through and do is label each of those as metals or nonmetals. That would help out. Okay? So we could go through and look them up. Bromine, written out as a nice word, that should be relatively easy to find as a metal or a nonmetal because what do we have access to? The internet. We type in bromine. Bing! It pulls up some data and it says it is a nonmetal. Wikipedia would probably be your Google link. B. You'd enter B into the internet and say, go. <laughs> Boron. Didn't help you out. Ah, so there's an interesting step. Okay. Bromine, mercury, and beryllium all have something in common. They're written out in the names. The other parts have symbols. So we have an extra step within this question. We need to know what those symbols are. Do you know those yet? No, that's part of the course. But that's where we'll be going. This is part of your work behind it. Okay, so we could look up boron, non-metal. And unfortunately, we look up mercury and we find out it's actually a metal. Sorry. Well, it's part of the class. Learn. Yeah. So I appreciate your attempt at it because we needed that. KR? Krypton. Krypton. Close. <laughs> Get rid of the I. <laughs> and then beryllium, and we could look those up. Okay, krypton is a non-metal. Beryllium is a metal. What could we do with that information, particularly if this were an exam? Ones are we know C and E are now wrong answers. We took a multiple choice question that had five possibilities, 20% chance of being correct, an 80% chance of failure, and we've now dropped that to a 60% chance of failure. That's pretty solid. Okay. Also when we go through and look at this list, that covers metals and nonmetals. So we looked at that definition of the word nonmetal, and we were able to classify and subdivide. We also have to read through the rest of the question. Was there another bit of information within that question? And a couple people have alluded to different phases. We have that this must be a liquid. So in our process of looking these up, we could then evaluate bromine turns out to be, guess what? A liquid. Boron is a solid. Mercury is a liquid. Krypton is a gas. Beryllium is a solid. With that extra piece of information, we find out the answer is A. Okay. So we go from me looking at C, which had some thought process behind it, but there was nothing for me to evaluate and see, were you thinking about this? I don't know if you're just guessing or if you have a massive misconception in the content. Whereas in this other case, if you made that mistake, I could point that out and be like, you missed there. Let's go back and review how we know what are metals and nonmetals. So the idea here is that you want us to essentially show how we got this. Yes, that is lovely. I want to see all of the work particularly for the RWSs. So for this particular question, that is what I would expect to see for your RWS submission. That now addresses all of the work that you could possibly dump into this question. That's what I want to see. Some questions are easier to provide work for than others. Okay? Who's the first person to discover an electron? Okay, well, Thompson. Okay, so your answer is now Thompson. How much context does that prove that you understand what's going on with that? Could you expand your answer to make it a little bit more understandable that you understand that? Yeah, you could say Thompson was the one, first one to discover an electron using a cathode ray tube. Okay. You've provided a little bit more context and research behind your answer, which for this first unit you will have to do. Okay. Unfortunately, the first unit is a lot of just, here's a fact, you need to know it. So address and tie as many true facts to that piece of knowledge as possible. <laughs> that will help you with the exams. Make sense? That was supposed to be content. I think I used up my 15 minutes. When do you get to start? Oh, you're 52? 
Oh, sweet. I got tons of time. I mean, just a question, like, because these, these are how the questions are going to be in the exams that you're giving, right? When you get the exam, that's what you would see with so, a I mean, number in front of it. Do, so, does the work count for points, or if you get the So, there's right, an interesting know. question. On the exam, what do I expect to see for the multiple choice? I expect to see. A bubbled in, okay. and that would be it. Okay, that's what I would want to see. Does that mean that's all you should write? No. no, you should be writing all of that extra work. And I know you're saying, but that takes time. Okay, yes, that does take time. Okay, but without taking that time to specify the work, what answer did we bubble in? C. C. We spent the time to get the work, and we guessed A, and we were right. We didn't spend the time to show any work, and we guessed C. Hmm. Spend time, be right. Don't spend time, be wrong. Spend the time, write down as much as possible. And in his defense, Mike set him up I did. for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, don't feel too bad. Okay. And that brings up kind of another part which... Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. Kind of our scientific method. So let's address this part because this is a good opportunity to bring this in. When we're looking at the scientific method, you've probably heard bits and pieces of the different things. But our ultimate goal is learning something new. Okay? And we start with an observation. Okay? We make a simple observation. From that observation, what do we do? We create a hypothesis. Okay, we say, I think that observation is happening because of this, this, this. Okay? We do a lot of that in today's society. I see that there's poor people, they must not work. What do we then need to do? Experiment. experiment. I have to test that hypothesis. I have to come up with an experiment that tests that. Okay? It gives me data that I can then evaluate. And I find out that poor person is actually working 50 hours a week, but they're not getting paid for it. What does that mean? Your hypothesis is wrong. My hypothesis is wrong. So what do I have to do at this point? Go back and review it. Ooh. And this is where science seems <coughs> to kind of ignore what's happening. Okay? And there are arrows in there. We run into some kind of color issues. Most scientists will say, well, from this experiment, we then have conclusions. And those conclusions, that says conclusions, just pretend. Okay? Conclusions to give us natural law or theories and all that kind of fun stuff. Okay? That works in probably less than 1% of the, the situations. Most of the time, what happens is you fail. Your hypothesis was wrong or your experiment was straight up crappy and you got nothing useful out of it. That means you have to reiterate and go back to a hypothesis. Back to a hypothesis, you redesign an experiment, you run the experiment, and what happens? Go sideways again, and you failed. And you go back to a new hypothesis, and you design a new experiment, and then what happens? It. it fails again. And this is the part that we don't talk about when we talk about science. Science is failure. Okay? You talk to the really famous scientists that look at Nobel or that earn Nobel prizes. And they talk about, well, how did you come up with that? How not to create the light bulb and stuff like that. Yeah. Like the two other ways. You need to deal with those failures and adjust and come back. So why do scientists continue in science if all they do is failure? That one time that they succeeded, they got such a massive rush from how awesome that worked out. They're like, I can do it again. No, I can't. <laughs> but I'm going to try again. Oh, no, I can't. Okay? And they keep going back through these painful iterative cycles of failure until they succeed. Right? And that's one of the things that tends to drive people away from science. Because the only thing scientists go out and tell people is, hey, look at how awesome I was. 
right? Just never mind that, that junk that's behind the curtain that I failed at. Okay? They only talk about the success. So that when new people come into the field, they look at these people that are brilliant. Oh my gosh, look at how cool you were. You're so brilliant. I'm going to do that on my first try. Okay? Because you did. Okay? And we find out that we can't do that. Okay? We have to deal with that failure and go back and change. So it's about that kind of iterative process. And while you guys were paying attention up here, there was a little bit of misdirection in the background because Greg was adding something to one of our boards. Would you like to go through that for us, Greg? So I was trying to model map out what I saw you just describing. So this is what my notes might look like in my spiral. You know, we talked about, so one of the goals of scientific method, or the goal of the scientific method is learning something new. That was actually really interesting to me because I forgot that from last year. Um, but because often I think of the scientific method as this really big official thing, but it's got a really simple, straightforward goal. It's just about learning something new. Um, and so, uh, and then, so a couple of these steps um, are pretty standard: observe, hypothesize, experiment, conclude, kind of stuff. Um, and I tried to give an alternate definition of hypothesis. Tell me how how you how how well that I did with that. So I did an educated or intuitive guess. It depends on what's going on. I yep. didn't want to just do straight guess because I feel like you, you might get upset about that. Um, but I guess, yeah. I'm all for somewhere. guessing. Okay. You have to start somewhere. Guess. Don't just guess and walk away from it. Guess, own the guess, and test it. And a lot of times when people say guess, they, 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 they walk away. What they're really talking about is there's an intuitive knowledge. You've seen, you've kind of experienced life. So your hypothesis is what you think is happening, but it's often based on um, this uh, this kind of sub-level knowledge that your brain knows but that isn't always on the surface. So a lot of times if it's just a guess, it's intuitive. It's based on kind of a feeling or a sense that this is the case. So that's part of the amazingness of the scientific method is that's about taking those invisible thoughts, beliefs, um, hypotheses about the world and making them, uh, and proving them right along, uh, which can be really, uh, or failing. Um, and so then, obviously, I, I kind of thought, took it as a flow chart on this next step. So you could get a conclusion. Often that's only a partial conclusion, right? It's not a full conclusion, um, or it's just a bit of information. Uh, and then uh, if, you get it, if you don't get a conclusion, you're failing. And if you fail, then you rinse and repeat as needed. It's like chicken. Bottle says it, right? Trisme knows what's up. What do you guys think? <laughs> Does humanities do OK on that front? <laughs> I, think that, I think they picked that up pretty well. The other part that I actually thought he was going to write about or put up there would be the writing process. So maybe we'll have to get back to that a little bit later. Right, if we finish out our scientific method, we usually fall into two categories, a scientific theory. We have evidence to support theories. Theories isn't a hypothesis. Right? So we talk about like evolution. Evolution's a theory. That's not a hypothesis. There's evidence to support that theory. Right? Is it perfect? No, but theories don't have to be perfect. They have to be able to explain the observation. If it is explained, then we continue to use that. If they can't explain the observation okay, through experimental evidence, then we don't count that as a theory. That's a failure. You start again. Okay? The other option is something like natural law. Okay? We found something to be true in all cases. There are no exceptions. Okay? We're really running out of natural laws, okay, because those tend to be the ones that are most easily accessible okay, and easy to test for. Okay? So most people have already kind of gone through and done those. But the scientific theories, there's lots of options out there for potentially adding scientific theories, which is why you still get tons of PhDs and new people into science fields, because we're discovering new things every day. Okay? Which takes us kind of backwards, now i got to step back through all that, to where I really wanted to go, which is in why science. Okay, this is kind of a reverse direction of how I normally do it. Okay, so we've got three categories up there, a pessimist, an optimist, and a scientist. Okay, and they're all going to take a look at that, and what do they see? Okay, so let's see if we can classify some people in this class. What do you see? No, but you, right there. I think your eyes are all open, right? Yeah, what do you see in that image? Strawberry, Strawberry pie. pie. Strawberry pie. Strawberry pie. Strawberry pie. Strawberry pie. Strawberry pie. Strawberry pie. Strawber
strawberry pie. So I, I missed one. Oh, thank you. Probably have a real list. We have a strawberry pie. I just came back from California, spent the whole summer in California, did not realize what a strawberry actually tasted like. Don't tell, and I'm not saying that I haven't had strawberries while out here in Arizona, but I had completely forgotten what they tasted like based off of what I eat here in Arizona. Because strawberries are a hell of a lot better than the crap we get out here. Right? Strawberries are a phenomenal berry. If you get a chance to make it out into California during summer, find a farmer's market with strawberries and you will be blown away. What I see there is something awesomely delicious. I don't think there's an L or an E in there. Hashtag delicious. Right? Why didn't you bring us strawberries? Because I ate them. <laughs> that was easy. What else? What else do you guys see in there? I guess well, a pessimistic view would be that it's excessively sugary. There we go. A lot of seeds. Sugar. Seedy. So if you are prone to diverticulitis, it's uh, Yeah, bad you might have a problem there. It looks messy. Messy. Man, you guys are awfully pessimistic. <laughs> you guys are just trying to counterweigh the awesomely delicious? Well, what else can you put about that? I guess an optimistic person would say that it, it's like exciting to look at. It's appealing. Exciting. Appealing, but it's not an orange pie. Visually <laughs> <laughs> pleasing. Okay, pleasing to the eye. Back to the pessimist, man. Are you allergic to? I'm not. Okay. That would be unfortunate. What does the scientist see? Okay. We could go through the classification. Naturally occurring. Energy. Nice. Carbohydrates. <laughs> Using some terms to describe it. And those terms I would agree with from... And I hate, it's not that I hate to dig on biologists, but I'm going to dig on biologists, and I always do. But I would argue that that's the biologist. What would a chemist, physicist, or potentially even a mathematician say? Lots of atoms. It's collisions. Long long things. Long. I can make it better. <laughs> that's what a chemist says. You say, well, that's not really true. Chemists don't do that. Okay. Uh, how many of you have allergy medications? Why do you have allergy medications? Because a chemist came along and said, my immune system sucks. I can make it better by taking these drugs. Okay? I'm fighting a cold. My immune system sucks. I can make it better by taking some drugs that kill bacteria, antibiotics. Nearly everything that we're getting in science is because some egotistical maniac <laughs> who is addicted to failure <laughs> came in and said, I can do better. And they look at it and say, those strawberries came from Arizona. They're better in California. I'm going to California to source my strawberries. The sugar used for the glaze, they just use white granulated sugar. Well, that's crap sugar. That didn't have any good flavor. In it. I'm going to use turbinado sugar because turbinado gives me a better flavor out of that. They use white processed flour. I'm going to use whole wheat flour because it's better and healthier for you. Whoops, that was a mistake. I'm going to add a little bit of mascarpone cheese to the bottom of that, give it a nice little texture and a little flavor boost. Okay? Scientists go through and look at what they make as observations. They need to learn about it, but then they also go back and say, I'm going to learn enough about it that I can do better at it. Okay? I'm in that field, so yes, I do come off across as egotistical every so often. I'm not trying to, but that's kind of the nature of the scientific field. We look at it and say, I can do better. Okay? And that doesn't mean I'm the best. That just means I recognize I suck, and I know I can do better at it, so I'm going to keep doing it. So it's more so you're looking for improvement. I'm looking to improve. And where people see that as egotistical is people saying, well, you're saying you're the best. 
I, some scientists are like that, but for the most part, they're looking at it and saying, I know I can do better, and so I'm going to strive to do better. I'm going to fight through those failures. By the way, this is looking like a much more optimistic view of scientists than I have in past lectures, so I'm kind of liking it. Uh, trying to make things better. Okay? And they don't always. That's one of the reasons why people don't like scientists. Mustard gas? It's like for its own purpose, though. Like bad things can make things better. TNT. Yeah, why was TNT developed? To move mountains. To move mountains. To dig through mountains. To mine. To get access to minerals. To allow us to pass through from one side of a desert to go through the mountains so that we can be at the ocean. Okay. What do we use TNT for now? Kill to kill people. <laughs> okay. Scientists don't have the greatest track record because what they're looking at, in a lot of cases, not always, they're looking at trying to make the better world a better place. Okay? Through all, inventing something. All tools, so it depends and it's all you. tools. And then my favorite people to dig on, and I apologize if you are one of these majors, business people <laughs> look at those tools and say, I can repurpose that tool as this. And now I can make money. And when, okay? we, get, when we get to uh, talking about the technological aspect of writing, we'll talk about tools and technologies and some of this stuff. Before. And it's, so it's how you build from this. And that's kind of our origins behind how I at least approach chemistry and how we've tried to design this course, both in the English side and the chemistry side, is working through this and saying we can always improve. How do we improve? Okay? How do we make those steps? So it can seem egotistical, okay? but remember, we're not saying we're best. We're just saying we can do better wherever we start. Make sense? And again, I really, I actually kind of like that. That spun out a lot better than it has. So where is chemistry's role in the big picture of kind of science? Okay. Uh, this goes back to the egotistical part because you talk to mathematicians, physicists, or biologists, or even engineers, and everybody says, we're the bridge that connects all the different fields. Eh. Chemists tend to argue the same thing. Chemists tend to bridge the theory of mathematics okay, that gets tied into physics which is this weird numbers mumbo-jumbo nonsense. And chemists take that, manipulate it, twitch it around so that it actually kind of makes sense, and then tell the biologists, hey, this is what's happening when you made those observations. It's because of us. Okay. Never mind the fact that we got that information from the physicists and mathematicians, but it's because of us. Okay. So chemistry is kind of, at least according to chemists, is that bridge. It connects kind of the numerical world of theory into the real world of our general observations. Okay? General chemistry or chemistry breaks down into multiple categories. You get organic chemistry, biochemistry, inorganic chemistry, and physical chemistry. Okay? Really, these are just kind of subheadings or subdivisions within the field, and depending on what level or what side of that bridge you want to be on. Okay? I would argue the physical and the inorganic tend to be more on the mathematics and physical side. I mean, physical even has physics in it, for God's sake, right? Okay? So yeah, that tends to be a lot more heavy on the mathematics. Biochem, it has biology. Okay? That's what's happening with the biochem. They're more on the biology, the application side. The organic chemists, remember how I said we're egotistical and we like to be whichever one of us is the bridge? Organic chemistry bridges the gap between both of those. And if you remember that, I'm an organic chemist. Okay. It's trying to come up with different ways to come up with the patterns to allow us to interpolate or correct for our observations and the theories that tie them all together. Okay. What are we doing in this fundamental general chemistry class? All of that. Every little bit of it. We're doing the mathematics. We're doing the physics. We're doing uh, not so much the biology stuff, but it'll show up a little bit. We're doing the organic. We're doing the biochem. We're doing the inorganic. We're doing the physical. We're trying to do all of this information that has taken probably 800 plus years to collect. And I'm supposed to teach you that in 16 weeks. 
That should seem a bit daunting, and a, someone was like, eh, that wasn't a good idea, is it? It's true, it's not. Okay, so what we will do is kind of skip over the top, and it kind of the larger topics. Those larger topics you can then apply out to future chemistry classes, or you could apply out to biology classes, or you could just say, I'm glad I've done with my sciences. Take it away. I'm going to write books. Well, that's about all I got. Write books. I don't know what other people do. Don't we all just study science? OK. Science so, is everything. Science is everything. It's the bridge. Remember, it's, it's always there. So that was kind of our chapter one summary of our textbook. Uh, and then I'll skip around a little bit, and we would move into chapter three. But I think with that, I need to stop. And we'll pick up with that slide, uh, which will be posted if it isn't already on Canvas. Uh, and I'll try and set up some links out to it. The video.